everyone. My name is Genevieve Simpson. I'm the Vice Chair of the Perth branch of the Australian Institute of Energy. And we are very pleased to be here today uh, to host you along with the Australian Energy Council uh, for Matthew Warren's presentation, um, Lessons and Warnings from the East. Um, before we start, I would like to give an, an acknowledgement to country. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Noongar people, the traditional owners and custodians of the land we're meeting on today, and their elders past, present and emerging. Um, some order of events for today. So very shortly, our lunch will be served. Um, and at 12.55, we will have Scott from Australian Energy Council come up and give a formal introduction before Matthew starts speaking at one o'clock. Um, I would also like to bring your attention to this very large silver bowl, which is very empty of business cards at the moment. And we do have a door prize for those of you who I'm sure are very few in number who haven't yet read Matthew's book, Blackout. There are some copies that are gonna be available at the end of the day. So um, please sit back and relax and enjoy your meal. Um, if you have any questions, I will be around, uh, but otherwise we look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you. On behalf of the Australian Energy Council and the Australian Institute of Engineers, I'd like to welcome everybody here this afternoon for uh, what I think is a very special event, Lessons and Warnings from the East. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Scott Davis. I'm the WA Policy Advisor for the Australian Energy Council, uh, based here in Perth. So the Australian Energy Council represents the major electricity and downstream natural gas businesses who operate in uh, wholesale and retail competitive markets across Australia. And collectively, these businesses supply energy to over 10 million homes and businesses. We also create events like today, which help inform stakeholders about how we might think about the challenges before us in the energy sector and how we might address them. The energy sector continues to navigate an array of technical, political and social challenges, as well as uncertainty around uh, energy and climate policy. This is impacting on all levels of the, the nation's electricity supply systems. As Western Australia addresses the effects of these challenges with our own energy reforms, it's useful to reflect on the learnings from the national market as well as the unique context that we find ourselves in in Western Australia. It should be said, our current reform program is a step forward in securing WA's energy security, but I think we all recognise reforms will continue beyond the current program. Matthew Warren will provide his insights into our journey ahead. Matthew has worked in energy and environment policy for 25 years and has lobbied for the electricity, renewable energy and coal industries. He was the Chief Executive of the Australian Energy Council, the Energy Supply Association of Australia and the Clean Energy Council. He was also environment writer for the Australian newspaper and worked for the New South Wales Minerals Council. His first book, Blackout, How Is Energy Rich Australia Running Out of Electricity, is a synthesis of Matthew's professional career told as a narrative that helps us to understand how energy policy got messy and how we might move forward. So please welcome to the stage, Mr. Matthew Warren. Thank you, Scott. Uh, thank you, and look, it's um, great to be over here in, in Perth. Uh, I've been flying back to Perth or between the East Coast and Perth now for more than a decade with the Clean Energy Council, the SAA and the Australian Energy Council. And it's always a really interesting experience coming here. It's a, uh, I'm not saying this just because I'm speaking to a WA energy community, but it is a, a relatively sophisticated reading age uh, here. It's the level of self-sufficiency, I think, drives um, a sophistication in the debate that you don't find in similar events uh, over East. There's obviously very smart people there too. Um, and so it is, and it's also at this time really interesting to consider the opportunities and the challenges that you face, which are similar but different to uh, those operating inside the NEM and how you may navigate your pathway forwards. I'm also really pleased to be speaking completely unfettered from um, employment by major industri industry groups. Um, 
not much of my message will change, but I don't have to check my shots. Um, so I'm going to try and be fairly candid uh, about what I've observed, and I don't think anything I'm going to say will shock or surprise most of you. Um, you've been thinking about the things I'm observing for a while, but it's useful to call this stuff out. So, I mean, and the book, uh, I spent... Uh, most of the last financial years sort of writing and promoting this book was a bit of a catharsis. It was a just to, and it's useful to go back and remember how we got to where we are because it's important in thinking of how we progress forwards. And the first thing just to rem remember is that everybody started out in Australia much the same. So every major city built, started building a grid from the late 19th century through to the early 20th century, and they all looked fairly similar. That's a snap of the, um, the East Perth power station, which I understand you're looking for, you know, there's a long-standing debate about what to do with that building. Um, the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney was the first major power station that's been turned into a museum. Uh, there's an Aboriginal cultural centre in Adelaide, which is the first power station in the middle of town. So everybody's got these iconic buildings floating around in the middle of the, the cities where, where the grid first really started to get built. Um, it's useful to recall, too, that the electricity was first rolled out by, mostly by the private sector. Um, so it was kind of the dot-com boom of the late 19th century. Um, lots of um, investors trying to make money out of this amazing new technology which had everyone very excited. Um, and the reason why governments stepped in, both initially councils and then state governments stepped in to take over was because everyone discovered that the capital requirements of rolling out electricity were really beyond most private investors' ability to raise capital. So the litany of, of, of failures, of, of commercial failures of those buildings was manifest because they, they got in over their heads. So, for example, the first, the first tram that went in in Australia wasn't in Melbourne, it was in Hobart. And an investor went to, living in Hobart basically bought an entire train set from Siemens in Germany with these amazing trams and the track and a little power station, shipped them all on a ship, stuck, they got, arrived in Hobart, built the whole kit running along the coastline. Now, if you've been to Hobart, it's beautiful. Uh, the trams worked brilliantly. The Germans designed great stuff. Everything worked well with one small problem, which was he was hemorrhaging cash because he'd spent so much building this, he hadn't done, they didn't have Excel spreadsheets, and he hadn't worked out that no matter how many punters rode on his tram, he couldn't recover the costs of in the investment. So that was brought out by the... The, uh, the local council, then the state government. And I can tell you that story over and over again uh, across grids across the country, uh, and it was inevitably taken over by government because governments could see in the early 20th century that this electricity thing was crucial, not just for, for popularity purposes, but it drove economic growth. And so it was a natural fit by the middle of, by the time of World War, World War II, every state had basically taken control and was rolling out electricity. The reason why the switchback occurred in the late 20th century to private uh, investment and privatisation and, and, and the, sh the market changes that we saw was the, the change in, in the changing in the goalposts. The capital was now with the private sector. By the late 20th century, not just in electricity but car companies and airlines, governments were finding it challenging to find the funds to keep reinvesting and private sector found it much easier to raise money and to run those businesses. So we saw a lot of privatisation. Keating introduced competition reform, which was basically a trigger for opening up the electricity sector to that kind of private sector investment and competition for those reasons. WA was, was left out of that process and that transformation um, primarily because of geography. Um, well, I've just skipped that one. But, but, but effectively, the same thing applied. Um, and in 1995, uh, the move towards a capacity market was your solution for that, sort of trying to find ways of getting private sector investment into an expensive and expanding electricity grid. Um, so when we think about that, it's really important there are two levels, there are three levels, I think, but two basic levels of electricity markets. The first is there's a machine. There's a physical machine. And if we hadn't gone through that process of privatisation and and uh, shifting to market arrangements, you would still need a machine that works, that delivers the electrons at the scale required during different times of the day. It's kind of obvious, but we need to remember that that machine has to work. The reason I say that's important is we now have in places like South Australia a machine where I don't think it actually meets that minimum requirement. The machine is no longer operating at sort of the minimum levels that we would consider to be appropriate for an electricity machine in a developed country in the 21st century. Then on top of that, we build 
markets. And the markets are really various arrangements around the world to enable that investment to occur outside of governments having to fund all the, the new kit. You can still do it that way if you want and run it like a government department, but um, that's generally undesirable. What that's what introduced the third level, and I'll get to this in a second, is there's now a political overlay on top of that, because the markets, um, the market worked perfectly well um, in the East Coast, the energy only market. It was the politics of climate change which uh, which, which really basically undermined um, the market. So in 2000, and I was a journal at The Australian when this kind of all happened, um, climate change were, was a fascinating sort of interruption to this process because it actually had been coming, I mean, it's worth noting climate change had been coming as a policy threat for two decades by 2006, just that no one had really recognised it. So... Um, uh, NASA was presenting to congressional hearings in the 1980s warning of, uh, they were pretty certain that, that human activity was driving uh, temperature increases. Um, and this triggered an enormous response initially. So George W. Bush was out talking about the need, you know, the, the greenhouse effect, I think in some quote he said, you know, if you haven't heard of the greenhouse effect, what about the White House effect? Which was bragging that, that they would deliver, a Republican government would deliver sort of a solution for climate change. And the reason why they were so confident was that they had just solved another global atmospheric crisis, which was um, uh, chlorofluorocarbons. Uh, and, and so they figured if the world got together and signed an agreement and switched from one, one technique to another, technology to another, then we could just do the same thing again. So all these governments, having gone to this Rio Earth Summit in 92 and ratified the UNFCCC uh, uh, convention, went back to their respective treasuries and said, all right, so what do we do? You know, what do we, what do we sign? How do we fix this? And every government around the world discovered that the cost of mitigating greenhouse gases was far, far more complex and far more difficult than mitigating um, chlorofluorocarbons uh, uh, to protect the ozone layer. And that we saw that litany of failure. The first, the first uh, reform that the Clinton administration tried to bring in in early 93 was an energy tax, and that was driven by our, his deputy, his uh, vice president Al Gore, um, and that got wiped out by a Democrat-controlled Congress. Uh, the Europeans tried to bring in a carbon price, a very simple sort of carbon price that was rolled. Keating in '95 was advised by John Faulkner, his energy minister, we need a, we need to look at this carbon pricing. Keating looked at it very carefully, and he discarded it. So around the world, everybody looked at this and said, "Yes, we need to do something. Yes, that's too hard. We'll deal with that later." Um, and so by 2006, the issue hadn't gone away, it had only, the, the tensions had only increased, and I, I won't bore you with the politics, but effectively, you know, how, John Howard had quite successfully managed to do a de minimis approach to climate change, he'd introduced renewables, renewables policy in 2001. Uh, curiously, he also had adopted a, a rather modest little solar scheme called the Solar Homes and Communities Program back in 2000, and that was as part of the deal to get the GST across the line. And the Democrats slot, slotted this in as one of these little requests they made to get their votes on the floor. And that thing turned into rooftop solar in Australia today. So it was a, sort of an accident of policy history that, that we have this scheme which drove rooftop solar at the levels, of course, Australia's rooftop numbers are absolutely off the charts compared to anywhere else in the world. Uh, we used to, as the AEC, used to go around to go to international uh, meetings with our counterparts and just swap notes. And I sort of started turning up saying, yeah, we're getting rooftop solar around 15, 20, 25 per cent uh, in our cities. Some suburbs have 70 per cent. And I was waiting for the Americans to say, yeah, we've got the same thing. And they looked at us like, you what? You know, uh, uh, so it is a unique feature. Uh, and of course, in the lead up to the 2007 federal election, which Howard lost, as one of the things he did to try and pivot the, the federal government, the Howard government's sort of lack of action on climate change, he increased the rebate on the SHCP program to $8,000 per household, which is almost unimaginable by today's standards. And, and, drove, and he invented the politics of rooftop solar. Um, uh, that drove Rudd to do sort of similar things when he was in government, and it took probably the next five years for state and federal governments to wean themselves off massive subsidies for rooftop solar, and that's because it was so popular. Um, it was so popular. The, the main... When, when I was working at the Clean Energy Council, uh, I remember coming over here back in 2010, and Peter Collier was the energy minister um, at the time. Peter wasn't particularly interested in coming to a Clean Energy Council briefing about, uh, about renewables. 
um, until we started presenting for the, we were asking the regulator to tell us where all the rooftop solar was going in and which suburbs, and I started putting that up on the, the screen. And Peter Collier, his eyes lit like dinner plates because Peter could see marginal electorate, marginal electorate, marginal electorate, marginal electorate. So the big buyers of rooftop solar are sort of, uh, first home buyers and retirees. Um, and I won't go into the gory details. And they tend to live in marginal electorates, and this has been an issue which plagues this state and the grid right now, but it's plagued everybody in Australia for the past 10 years. The problem uh, has been, of course, nationally that we've really been unable to find common ground. We were very close in 2008 uh, when Rudd was elected successfully and Turnbull was opposition leader and there was a, a moment of brief detente where we thought we were going to get bipartisan agreement on emissions trading. Um, and then the global financial crisis hit. Uh, and basically that wiped out sort of international movement towards uh, aligning trading schemes and everyone went back to saving their economies. The carbon price in Europe was set back basically to zero to, because the, the lower income economies there just couldn't cope with the carbon price. And we've never, we've never got back to that point again. So we've never had that, the ability to deliver that kind of policy. And in fact, it's devolved to us of tribalism. Um, if I, think, I think the debate's gotten worse. Uh, so you now have sort of renewables acolytes on one side where everything's fixed by more renewables. And on the other side, you've got people sort of wanting to build coal-fired power stations in far north Queensland, because apparently that makes the entire grid work a lot better. So, and it, it's, it's not really based in any policy or science. It's purely now, uh, it's touched into that, I think this, broader divide we have in Australian politics between um, sort of cultural elites from the inner city if you, uh, as they're perceived by their, their rivals and, and those who think that political correctness has gone crazy. Um, and so we're no longer talking about running a machine successfully, we're talking about it being a symbol for um, quite a big division emerging in our, in our society. And this is all on top of, and it's too small to read, I apologise, but this is just on top of something which is kind of obvious when you think about it. When I was a kid growing up, my parents had what I call six password relationships. They had a bank account with a mortgage, they had a rates notice, they had a phone bill, they had a power bill. You know, I think they had a bank card, um, and that was kind of about it. Um, and today, of course, the number of part, you, it's if you sit and think about how many password relationships you have, you know, Wi-Fi and Netflix, and I mean, I, I, I couldn't fit them all on onto a. It's you, know, you could you get to 30 or 40 quite easily, and electricity is one of those that you don't even consider to be a good or a service. It's something that sort of you reluctantly a bill you pay. Uh, uh, you don't really consume the electricity; you consume the appliances that it powers, and so there's really. Uh, Households will be quite happy paying nothing for electricity or getting it for free because they don't consider it to be a service. So, and you're always billing people after the event, after the, after the consumption. So there's an enormous grudge purchase in this. And so trying to promote reform of this service is difficult because people are saying, well, I'm not sure why I should be paying for it in the first place. And, and whatever you seem to be doing is increasing the cost of it. It is useful to note that the actual cost the household spend on electricity hasn't really changed much in the past seven years. The ABS collects data on household spending as part of its basket of goods for the, CP, the Consumer Price Index. And uh, electricity's remained around 2%. So it's increased, the increases you've seen in power bills have reflected increases in household incomes. Uh, I think the problem we have with this is that it's a very visible change. It's certainly been an increase in power bills, uh, but the problem is that increase um, is visible, whereas other increases, well, I mean, my rates notice when I think about it, it's more than doubled in the last 10 years. Um, a number of other costs that we are incurring have increased while household incomes have remained relatively static. And so it's become a lightning rod for this frustration that I don't seem to be getting any more money, but the cost of living seems to be increasing. Um, and that's a in, in politics, that's real. So it becomes a difficult space to work in unless you can find ways of bringing everybody's power bill down. So if we go to the strategic end game on where we need to be, uh, I'm going to, uh, to me, there's, at the moment, there's four simple end game solutions. And that is a, a, a matrix between government ownership, or some, a combination of government ownership, a market solution, and renewables based grid or a nuclear based grid. And that's, as, if we're going to remove greenhouse gas emissions as we need to do at the rate we need to do uh, from our systems, uh, then that's basically it. We can use technology, we can use gas as a transition fuel, um, but I can't, right now there isn't fusion or anything else to suggest as an alternative to that. Uh, my observation on this, and the drawing on the left is, 
we actually started building a nuclear power station in Australia in the mid-60s. Um, I think the Holt government, uh, there's, a, there's a car park near Murray's Beach near Jarvis Bay, and it's an unremarkable beach in the middle of nowhere with a great big car park. That car park is the concrete pad they poured for the nuclear power station. So back then, that part of the, of, uh, it was ACT territory, because when they were originally planning Canberra, they were debating whether to build the city, the capital city on the coast or inland, and sadly they chose inland, because um, uh, they were afraid of Russian dreadnoughts bombarding the nation's capital. Um, it's true. And so, <clears throat> imagine how Canberra on the coast would have been great. Um, but anyway, so this beach, this, this unremarkable beach has a, a nuclear power station concrete pad uh, for a car park. And the idea back then was that uh, Australia was considering developing nuclear weapons, and so you need a new, so the, the, the correlation between nuclear generation and that being able to develop weapons grade plutonium. Anyway, it didn't happen. Um, the debate on nuclear, to me, is framed by four words in Australia, which is Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, Fukushima, and The Simpsons. Uh, and <laughs> none of them are particularly positive. Um, uh, and I've recently seen the Chernobyl miniseries, which is absolutely stunning. And if you haven't seen it, I recommend I don't watch TV and it was brilliant. And there's a podcast with it, which is even better. Um, but the point being, the, I don't think you can sell nuclear power. I think all the, the, the sort of debate we're seeing sort of popping out of parts of Canberra and North Queensland is really just, just a sideshow. I don't think you convince Australians of a nuclear future unless you've demonstrated to them you've tried and failed with a renewables future. I just don't think politically it's, it's possible. Uh, but I think if you've, if you've demonstrated, if you've genuinely tried to solve using renewables and you just reach a point where you can't go any further, I think that debate comes open. But that's probably at least a decade away. So if we accept the R square, whether it's government or, you know, in a sense that's the machine is going to be renewables based, then the really big question, because the enormous collapse in price of solar and wind, is, is how do you firm renewables at scale? That's it. That's the machine question. Um, and that's a picture of, of um, the uh, uh, gas uh, reciprocating engine, the sort of the latest peaking gas technology which is going into South Australia, the, sort of like a car engine using gas, so they're very fast response. Um, so obviously we can, and the challenge here is, is pretty simple, we can use gas, but that uh, is less, it's more, it's easier to use, but it's less efficient because you're running two sets of capacity. You've got a renewables generator and then you need an equivalent gas generator to back it up. So storage is more efficient because it obviously matches perfectly with, with renewables and firms it of its own energy, which is highly desirable with one small problem is that the technology is not ready. We don't have storage at scale that we can deploy. We're seeing small amounts of batteries going into parts of, of not WA, but also, you know, there's, there's a battery in South Australia, the Hornsdale Wind Farm, 100 megawatts capacity, 129 megawatts capacity, biggest battery in the world. Currently, I think it's about to be eclipsed. Um, that would be, need to be, you need a thousand of those to back up the South Australian grid on its own. So it's tiny in terms of scale and volume of generation. Um, but it's certainly an extremely useful bit of technology, uh, particularly for frequency services and for stabilising the grid. So batteries will play an important role with renewables, but right now I can't see any technology providing battery, te battery at scale, uh, and I'd love to be wrong. Um, so that's why there's a lot of interest in hydrogen, which is a kind of a, a simple chemical, I mean, not that it's a new technology, pumped hydro, which is, you know, replaces the physical the, the, the bulk physical capacity, um, but I think that's really the big question for everybody running grids at the machine level. Okay, so just sort of jumping to what I, just a simple kind of observation, what's, what are the strengths and weaknesses you have in the West compared to the East Coast? Um, and I'm sort of saying this, holding aside the political um, construct that, that sort of is grinding things to a halt there. First, I just say you have cheaper gas, and that's as a transition fuel, that's an enormous advantage because the, the opportunity cost of you using gas to firm increasing renewables is much lower than it is in the East Coast and it's more available. Um, I, I don't think that, I think they're different gas markets. Uh, we've always, the AEC managed to walk quite happily with suggesting that reservation policy made complete sense for WA, whereas it doesn't work in the East Coast because it's a small disaggregated supply and so if you try and reserve any gas there, 
then the gas won't develop because it's producing it below cost. So whereas you have larger gas fields here where the licence to operate for Chevron and those players is reliant on the state government, so you're able to run a reservations policy and you do. The East Coast has an advantage and it's got a lot more pumped hydro options. I was looking at the map produced in 2017 and really around, around, around Perth, there's a couple of uh, coal mine options around Collie uh, and there's one in a town near there, but it's, it's, you don't have a lot of, it's pretty flat and dry. You don't have a lot of scale for pumped hydro, which isn't good. Um, you have, and I can't overstate this, you have relative, you know, you may not think you do, but you have relative political unity relative to the East Coast. Um, uh, the isolation of that debate has, and I think the level of self-sufficiency here is I, I've, I've found dealing with whether it's Mike Nahan or Bill, um, is that there's a relative level of cooperation. I, I don't think the Labor Party here is driven um, to extremes by the Greens in the same way they are on the East Coast. I don't think the Coalition is driven to extremes by the same way they are by One Nation and others on the East Coast. So there is the opportunity for greater bipartisanship, which I don't think exists at the moment over there. Um, the NEM Federation can be used as a political peloton, so that can be advantageous, though at the moment I think it's the opposite. You know, we have a federal minister who's basically saying there's no problem with electricity, so we don't even con convene meetings of the COAG Energy Council, uh, which is a worrying sort of uh, observation, but that's kind of where politics is at over there. I think you're isolated, which is a, a, obviously a, a problem and a benefit. You're isolated from the stresses of the NEM and the current dysfunction there, but it also means you can't use transmission um, to solve problems in the way that you can. And we're certainly going to see increased interconnection uh, with the NEM states, which makes a lot of sense. The trick with, and the trick with transmission, of course, is it's so, it's not, it doesn't generate electrons, but it's so dependent and, and related to generation. So getting that planning right of having sufficient transmission to make grids secure without realising that you're sterilising investment in new generation that's needed to fill the transmission lines is the, is the challenging bit. You probably don't have that challenge. You already have a flawed capacity market. Um, I mean, I, I think by definition almost every capacity market is in some way flawed because it's a second best way of solving for um, capacity. But, and you almost invariably have to pay too much for capacity under any design that I've ever seen, unless you don't have one, uh, which is what the NEM was designed to do, uh, using forward contracting of swaps and, uh, and uh, caps uh, as a capacity payment. That worked fine until kind of the renewables at scale came along. And they're obviously looking, with a 2025 review, they're, looking to cons they're exploring capacity market options um, because that's the only way they can see of getting the firming capacity in at scale. Mostly government-owned generation, mostly government-owned generation, although more private sector ownership in the East Coast. So some of the, you know, we, this is about lessons from the East. Um, so what are the, you know, and some of these, I think it's important. The first is we'll never know if emissions trading could have worked. Um, and that's, in a sense, that might be a shame. It was, from an economist perspective, that's the first best solution because it affected, it was the way in which you let the, and I don't want to be mean, you let the nerds who run the electricity machine run it. And you don't tell them what to do, you just simply change the price signals for the different bits of kit coming into the machine. And then they're allowed to do what they need to do to keep the machine entire. And it's the least interventionist in terms of the engineering, and I, and I think that's why it was the most desirable from an economics perspective. We'll never know, we'll never know if it could have worked or not. I mean, the NEM, I think the energy only market as designed in the 90s, by, the, by around 2005, 2006, uh, there was anxiety growing that the market signals for new investment worked partially. They were good at getting peakers built, but there was question marks over replacement for large coal-fired generators because of the scale of that investment, and people were deferring those investments because they were uh, of the size of them. So we'll never know whether that was actually going to be a problem or not. Um, so we don't know if the first best was actually first best because we never got to find out. Second, and I was, in, I was, I was at the Clean Energy Council when the RET got legislated, uh, and... Um, the, the debate around renewables at that time in 2009 was all about cost. So nobody was remotely, nobody raised the issues of integration of renewables at scale, nobody raised some of the technical challenges of frequency, it was that, nobody. Uh, it was purely how do we keep the cost of this thing down because renewables at that time were much more expensive then than they are today. Um, and so 
it just had really poor design features. It was purely, everything was designed to find the cheapest renewables regardless of where they went. And of course, as a result, about 40% of the large scale renewable projects went into South Australia, which is a small, relatively isolated grid uh, on the edge of the, the NEM. And the problems that ensued there are well documented. The lesson number three is uh, that big renewables blow up energy only markets. Um, that's the Northern Power Station in South Australia, which literally got blown up. Um, uh, but it went, it went broke because, first of all, we learned an interesting lesson, which kind of, no one, again, no one had thought about, which is when you put enough renewables at scale into a grid, it drives the coal generators to the wall because they cannot switch on and off to, you know, they, they, they have to basically, they have to switch on and off on a daily basis. Uh, as renewables dive into the market and then come out, um, the coal-fired generator there simply could not cope with those changing conditions. Um, so it's a physical limitation of coal. Coal and renewables simply don't go together. Nuclear and renewables do not work together for the same reason. Nuclear power stations cannot switch off. So if you're going to run nuclear and renewables, they're going to have to work different sides of the street because they, at the moment with nuclear technology, they simply don't work well together. They don't, they, that doesn't have the flexibility. Um, the real problem, though, in South Australia is if South Australia is the future of a big renewables on the current design, is the liquidity of the contracting market has collapsed. So it, it no longer values capacity at all. Um, you can, it's very hard to buy caps and swaps. You can buy some caps for, from peakers. But effectively, the, that market mechanism to value capacity has been eliminated under those conditions. And so obviously, South Australia needs firming capacity to firm up its very large renewables. Um, and it needs to find that as efficiently as possible. And it can't just keep relying on interconnectors to do that. Uh, but it's unclear as to how you deliver that signal without some kind of direct capacity payment. Lesson number four is that rooftop solar is overtly political and under-regulated. Um, uh, and that's because it was really only of a design... It was introduced as a sort of a popularity... It was a popularity, a political prop by a, a government that was pulling every lever it could to try and recover its political position. Um, and so... What they discovered was PV, rooftop PV is incredibly popular, and it's incredibly popular in marginal electorates, uh, as I pointed out. I went through the, the database from the Clean Energy Regulator, uh, most recent numbers, and tracked just where is the PV, rooftop PV in WA by electorate. And, uh, you know, of not all, but about 70% of the seats that swung from the Liberal, the Coalition to Labor at the last state election have all very, very high penetration rates of solar PV, which of course everyone knows. Um, but it's important to call it out because this makes it politically very challenging uh, without accepting that that's the, the, the condition and that if you want to try and constrain installation of PV, then you are doing that in seats which political parties will be fighting over at the next state election. And, and I can tell you that the, you know, uh, the public, that punters like, the, like PV because it saves them money and the thought of you Denying them access to a technology which can save them money is not something that's going to be very popular. That's not rocket science, but let's be honest about it. Um, lesson number five, this isn't just a transformation, it's a live R&D project. Um, uh, th so this is really, really important that we aren't just upgrading from, from one technology which is developed to another technology which is developed. We're developing the solutions as we are transforming. Um, so we, you know, there is a debate about what will provide large-scale storage for renewables, and there's tribalism between the hydrogen clan and the chemical batteries clan and the, and the, and the pumped hydro clan and, and all the other different sort of variants. And the answer is, I don't know who's right. Uh, I don't know how that will apply. So, uh, and I don't think we're really addressing that. There's funding from ARENA, but it's relatively ad hoc. Um, but we... We are, we are solving for this in real time, and that's, if we don't get that right, that's going to become really problematic. Um, the advantage, at least in WA, is because you do have relatively affordable gas, you have relatively effective solutions, but that will always come at an efficiency loss. Six, just noting the East Coast gas markets, you know, it kind of are really a combination of everything going wrong or at the same time. Um, so you have the, close, the, the dial down of the very large and cheap gas reserves at the Cooper Basin, the development of expensive, more expensive tight gas fields on the east coast, um, and some of those gas fields were quite proximate to regional communities. 
um, and they became quite weaponised against, uh, against uh, that gas development, against fracking. Um, and also, in order to get the, those high, more expensive gas projects developed, they, the bankers needed to see that they could sell that gas at a higher price, which is obviously higher than the cost of extraction, which means they need to open the East Coast to international markets. Uh, and Gladstone was developed. And I think that there was kind of, there are three LNG projects, three trains developed. There should have been two, but everyone was playing a game of chicken and hoping that if they kept going with their projects, someone else would drop out. Nobody did. So we have a huge demand to fill those LNG trains. And tight gas fields tend to be their flow rates around the world are lower than people anticipate, so there's a scarcity of gas on the East Coast. To the point where we're openly talking about LNG import terminals into Melbourne and, and a ship doing the same sort of thing into New South Wales. Um, I think the general view is whatever it takes to get more gas into that market because it's undersupplied. Um, you don't have that problem here, and that's just noting that. And seven, I, look, I'd simply observe that when there's no leadership, everything turns into Game of Thrones. Um, uh, this is a snap of that. So we have different agencies, which, in, you know, the market operator, the Commission, the Australian Energy Market Commission, the AER, um, and we've also created this new body, which is the uh, Energy Security Board, which was really designed originally to implement the Thinker Review and has now found this whole new life as a sort of a electricity repairman for governments that goes in and does fix-it jobs on things and, and is commissioned way outside its original remit. And this is... And there's a you know, there's sort of a fairly well-understood ideological feud between the market defenders in the Commission and the market operator in the, in the AEMO, who is trying to... AEMO is saying, look, you guys can talk about the market as much as you like. We just need this kit at this part of the grid now, and we're going to find a way of getting it in. Um, and so I understand those tensions. They're allowed to exist when there is no leadership, when there's no plan. So it's not the fault of the institutions. They're just doing their jobs, and they're doing it in an unfettered way because nobody's actually organising this. It's, it's a really dark place to be. And I simply observe, I can't see any, anything that's going to... This is going to get worse before it gets better. So, some predictions. How good is Snow 2.0? How good is it? Um, um, uh, I would simply... Uh, Snow 2.0... My big concern with Snow 2.0 is that it, will, it was a press release. It was originally sort of an idea by Malcolm Turnbull who could see the, you know, the likelihood that it was going to be a useful asset in a high renewables grid and therefore would just get on and build it. Um, and the problem with it is, first of all, it's going to be quite a, it could be quite expensive. Most people think that it'll be far more expensive than the numbers being quoted around three to four billion, more, north of ten. Um, and, it will, and it may delay, um, they may not get to their full rate of capacity. Um, and my concern is that the federal government, having sort of put a bit of money on the table, will just let that shift along slowly. While Snowy 2.0 is an idea that's under development but not completed, there's no new capacity into the New South Wales market. Everyone else trying to build new capacity into the New South Wales market is waiting until Snowy 2.0 is finished so they can see how big it is, how it works, how it affects the market, so their bankers can finance their projects. That's really unhelpful when Liddell is due to close in 2022 um, and the solution at the moment is to increase interconnection to Victoria and Queensland, but of course Transmission on its own is just moving and delaying uh, the generation problem around and it won't solve for anything. So, and those interconnector upgrades will go ahead, the Q&I and the V&I, um, but they are sort of band-aids while the generation problem and the firming problem is fixed. I reckon that the second Tasmanian interconnector is an absolute monty to be announced sometime next year um, because on current form the federal government will simply be running a series of announcements in, in lieu of a plan or policy, it will just run a series of announcements. It's already talking about this quite proactively. Um, story in the Financial Review this morning that the existing interconnect, the, um, the Bass Link, which is privately owned, is under quite fun <coughs> acute financial stress, partly related to its, uh, its uh, fault switching off for three months in 2016. But that notwithstanding, that won't stop a second interconnect going in, which doesn't make a lot of sense commercially, but none of this is being driven by commercial consideration. Um, the retailer reliability obligation, which is this designed to try and force, um, use, a, use a market mechanism to force firm capacity into the NEM by requiring retailers to effectively contract for firm capacity. Uh, I think the jury, it's, it's, I don't think that, I think there's a significant possibility that it won't work. Um, there are businesses out there at the moment who are offering insurance contracts for renewable projects that guarantee profit. 
And they aren't linked to firm generation. They're linked to um, risk and hedge funds in Europe. So this is the problem of you can find ways of managing risk, commercial risk, that keeps more renewables coming into the market without having to firm for those investments. And I mean, I, the, the retail of reliability obligation is a good idea, but I'm just not certain that it's going to work. Um, demand response will evolve slowly. Um, there's been a lot of, you know, you're familiar with the demand response here through um, recent activity in your own capacity market. The main challenge with demand response is always, if you're going to contract it, is the firmness of that demand response, the, the real availability of it. Um, it will evolve, it needs to evolve. We need a more dynamic response, that's absolutely clear, but it's un less clear how that works. Uh, the AMO has been contracting RERT, the reliability, re reliability um, and emergency trading uh, contracting, but the cost of that is still very high, which reflects the immaturity of that market. Talk about nu nuclear will just be to distract. I don't think that's going to progress in any way forwards. And finally, uh, Queensland and Victoria will continue to roll out their own private sector, uh, their own to crowd out private sector renewables investors with their own um, schemes to run some state based uh, investment in renewables, which is unhelpful given that there are businesses over in those states who've developed really successful businesses uh, deploying solar. We have no shortage of solar going in. Uh, it's more for political optics than it is for anything that the market needs. So, lots of dysfunction over there. It's good not to be part of it. What do you need to do next? I, I think, and I mentioned this in the book, the next great electricity experiment in Australia, unless you do something about it, is going to be minimum demand by 2025 being run almost entirely by rooftop solar PV in, in the WEM. Um, and I, I don't think that that's, I think that's avoidable, but it's not, it's avoidable Technically, but it's, the problem is political because of the nature of what you need to do to curtail or condition further investment in solar PV to avoid that event. So first, I think, play to your strengths. You still have the opportunity to take a bipartisan or develop a bipartisan approach uh, in the West, and I strongly recommend you take it. Because if you don't, the problems that are building in these, these, these machines are effectively like governments handing a, a loaded gun back to each other like Russian roulette, and whoever gets gets the blackouts on their watch is the one going to be held accountable, but the problems are developing now. And we saw that in South Australia, is really it wasn't Jay Weatherall's fault, it wasn't the South Australian government's fault, it was a problem that was 10 years in the making and he was just the guy in, in the seat when the thing happened. Um, and it's not the fault of the renewables, by the way, it's the, the renewables are a machine, they work exactly as they, as, the, as they say on the box. In fact, I'd say on the, 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 the day of the system black, I was rem, impressed how how sophisticated wind energy technology has become because the wind speeds they were operating in uh, on that day in South Australia were pretty high and they were hammering. They weren't switching off, they were coping quite easily with those wind speeds and they were powering about 70% of uh, indigenous generation when the system black occurred. So the next the simple idea is separate the running of the machine from the politics and let the nerds do their job. I kind of use the Reserve Bank analogy the way we got out of hyperinflation uh, in Australia was we, we really we made the Reserve Bank completely independent so that it was allowed to do its job and target inflation. Um, and I think that model can work here. Um, it enables governments to be able to have an independent agency making difficult decisions which are, the, are politically unpopular uh, but which need to be made. And you're certainly facing some of those right now. You don't have to be a global experiment in high uh, PV penetration if you don't want to be. It's, it's useful to do it, maybe in a more controlled fashion. I also think that the obvious one, regardless of whether you get to cost-reflective pricing, is at least reform tariffs so that we have, you know, we don't have implicit subsidies in the way in which we're billing customers for electricity, that they're paying the true cost of, of transmission, distribution and generation. Uh, and maybe listen to AMO. AMO's job they are the experts who are trying to advise you on how the machine is supposed to work, and if we're allowing that kind of expert advice to be acted upon, then it would make life a lot easier. Um, finally, uh, uh, Saturday was the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing, and I've, my wife and I have been reading books about it and listening to podcasts, and we went down to the bridge in Melbourne and we looked at the moon through telescopes. And, uh, and what was interesting in... in of course, in the 60s, was, there was an enormous space race uh, between the Soviets and NASA about who got to the moon first, and for a long time, the Soviets were in front uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. The reason they never got anybody on the moon was not because they didn't have the capacity, but because 
their efforts to develop the technology kept getting interfered with by the, the, um, the Central Committee. And so when they were trying to do things which were the next logical step in, a, in a putting a person on the moon, the Central Committee said, no, we want to do something for, to show the Soviet people that we're in front. And by doing that, they diverted the resources from the, the, the intent, and so NASA overtook them, and NASA got onto the moon first, and, and in fact, the only people who get there. So be NASA, not the Soviets, you know. Um, it's government have an important role to play in ensuring that the lights stay on and that this service is delivered as critically as possible. But if we can allow those who understand the technology to deliver the technology uh, under the sort of direction of government, then that may be a better model than trying to do it from Parliament House. Thank you. We've now just a couple of minutes available for some questions from the audience. Matt Bowen, what a surprise, ready to go. Thanks, uh, Matthew, Matt Bowen, uh, I'm a regulatory lawyer. Um, that was a sensational presentation, thank you so much. I think we, uh, we all are grateful for your insights. If you listen to the government speak uh, in Western Australia and perhaps um, around Australia, in addition to talking about the things you've talked about, which for all the energy industry insiders are exactly what we need to think about, we think about the machine, we think about the market, we lament the politics. <coughs> um, what the West Australian government keeps talking about is also focusing on the consumer and protecting the consumer and bringing, and bringing along all consumers, including, um, you know, Jess Shaw's always talking about the single mum up at Ellenbrook who's never going to be able to afford distributed energy. Can you talk about where that fits into the picture? It's, it, look, it's a good point. I mean, the problem, one of the problems that governments face is tariff reform is, is a perfect example, which is you can get 98% of people better off through effective tariff reform, but governments will say, but there's still that 2% of people who are worse off, and they, some of those are people who are vulnerable, and therefore I can't allow this. Uh, I can't, on my watch, I can't countenance being the person who has a story in the West Australian the next day of some battling mum whose bills doubled because of the way it's worked out for her. Um, and and I, that, I get that. Um, so it doesn't mean you don't do these things, but you don't, you've, we've got to stop using electricity as social policy. Um, it's, it just doesn't work. Uh, I mean, we, as it is, you can, and you can countenance this by explaining how much that single mum has already been paying to affluent households through the, through the implicit subsidy of, of not having cost-reflective pricing and through the way in which we structure payments for solar PV so that, I mean, I, we, we have solar on our roof and I got into the, I got the premium tariff in Victoria, so I'm getting 66 cents a kilowatt hour for every, everything I export, you know. <laughs> to, you know, it's outrageous, it's outrageous. Um, uh, and so there's no, we don't, it's so inequitable now. Um, and I, I, it's, this is the cha these are the challenges of government. It's no good saying, oh, somebody's going to be worse off. We, that's, you know, I remember I was talking to Patricia Carvelis from Radio National a couple of weeks ago, who, uh, who is of Greek descent. And she was making a really interesting point about the accord. We were talking about when Bob Hawke died and about the accord. And why we lament that people like Hawke dying is because that's what, to me, that's what leadership looked like. And she said, the Greek communities in the early 80s were the people working, and the, the poor Greeks were working in the sewing machine factories and the, uh, the clothing, textile, and footwear industry that we still had back then. And they were the ones whose jobs went to the wall under the reforms of the Accord. And they went with it anyway because Hawke explained that, yes, we'd lose these jobs, but we got cheaper goods here and new jobs created here. And those people did find jobs in other industries and they did see the benefits and they supported Hawke, they were Labor voters, they didn't abandon him for that reason. Uh, and that's what good leadership looks like, is that you have to make tough calls, you explain it to people, and if you can take them with you, then you can deliver the reform. This populism is, isn't working, you know, and the populism ends up with a, a, system, you know, a system black or whatever it looks like, and then we have this massive sort of recoil and we invest, over-invest in solutions and the thing teeters from one crisis to another. And we all know that doesn't work. So this is the time for leadership. And it's, it's tough, but it's, um, and I think it's tougher to make those decisions now than it was back in the 80s. I think the nature of media has changed and the nature of the, the community is more disaggregated and more atomic in the way they see information. But that doesn't mean we don't do it. Otherwise, this is going to get a lot worse. Um, 
Thank you, Matthew, for um, a really great presentation, for saying all the things that most of us think about anyway. Um, I have a small question that I'm really curious to know your view on, is we talk about firming of renewables in the NEM. It's not the solution to everything, but nobody really seems to talk about the Snowy system as it exists currently being used as a firming generation supply rather than just being allowed to run as a normal generation supply and uh, take advantage of the market as it is. Surely that should be our first call before we start building Snowy 2.0. So, so, yeah, look, it's a good question. Hydro's, in, hydro's about 7% of total generation, varies between 5 and 9, depending on how much rain there is. So, and Snowy's about half of that. Um, as a general rule, Snowy, Snowy Hydro run the generation to maximise returns. So they tend to run now as an intermediate. They don't run as base load. They just run, they run when prices optimise for them to dispatch, and as they should. So, I mean, it, but the trouble is it's of a scale which is still relatively small and can't solve for, it's not big enough to firm all the renewables that are now going in the NEM. Um, and even Snow 2.0 won't have enough capacity to do that, but it's a useful step in the right. There's nothing wrong with Snow 2.0 from an engineering perspective. It's terrific. It's just that it might, you know, they'd, the, it might, they're drilling through loose rock, which can cost a fortune if it's, it's not hard rock. It's the stuff that collapses around you when you're, Drilling it, I think it's 26 kilometres of tunnel on the original plan, which is a lot. So, um, but it will it will help. But I think that's it won't be enough to firm the renewal. I mean, the, the market is designed. You don't need to have a firm generation, a firm generator attached to a wind farm. Um, some businesses do it because they want to be contracting and participating in the contract market. Um, that's a more commercial choice. But you, the, the market's designed to provide firming through the market signals. That's where it does work. Um, it's just that the snow will be still overwhelmed in scale, even if it, when it proceeds. And but so we need to find other solutions, and that poses challenges for the West because you don't you don't really have anything of that scale that I can see that's easily adaptable. Um, but you may find other other things. That's you know, innovations, the mother of invention. So. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. And by the way, I mean, I I should say preface this. I don't think I've ever set, given a presentation where I've ever said anything that's particularly new. Um, uh, I, I generally just say stuff that everyone already knows, but just put it in an organised fashion. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, the purpose of this is I find this a very high reading age audience, but sometimes it's useful to come in and say the stuff that everyone's thinking, but no one's allowed to say. Thank you very much. I think that's a great summary of the pre presentation, actually. Um, if you'll all please join me in thanking Matthew Warren for coming out today. Thank you very much, Matthew, who's provided copies of his own book for everyone to enjoy. So, um, greatly appreciated by the AIE. Um, and on behalf of the AIE, I'd also very much like to acknowledge the Australian Energy Council um, for jointing with us today. I, don't, I just turned jointing into a kind of a verb for the use of presentations. Um, I think some people uh, have raised with us whether we're concerned at all about the idea of um, Australian Energy Council having a greater presence in WA and far from it, I think that every additional kind of industry body that represents energy creates extra vitality and conversation. Um, we've had so many people come to us. Uh, just this week we've had guests from the Energy Security Board come over to WA and talk about the vitality that's happening in WA. Um, we are isolated, we are disconnected from the rest of the country, but that does give us great opportunities. Um, and in particular, as speaking on behalf of the government trading enterprises, I think there's also a little bit of an opportunity there as well. Um, just before we head out, um, I would like to do a quick run through for other Australian Institute of Energy events coming up. So tonight, if you'd like to do a double header, there is a Women in Energy Networking event um, at The Shoe, I think it's called, in Yagen Centre. Um, the 13th of August, the Women in Energy have a panel discussion called The Broader Economic Impacts of Energy Transformation. Check out those tickets. It is going to be a fantastic panel event. Um, the 19th of August, we're about to send out invitations to an ATCO Hydrogen Hub visit. Um, it's on a Monday, so you might have to get a little bit of time off work, uh, but it's going to be a great event for those who can attend. We also, uh, a little bit of a plug for membership with the AIE, our corporate members are going to be invited to an exclusive uh, lunch with the Energy Minister. We're again partnering with another agency, the um, Energy Efficiency Council. 
So that's going to be another um, event to uh, get involved with if you can. Um, and finally, of course, we would like to promote the Energy in WA conference, which is a partnership between the Australian Institute of Energy and our good friends right here, Department of Treasury. Thanks for coming and joining with us. Um, sponsorship opportunities are still available, so please head to the Energy in WA conference website if you're interested. Um, finally, uh, Australian Institute of Energy, can any of the committee members for either the Women in Energy, Young Energy Professionals or AIE please put your hands up? We've got a couple sitting around today, so if you have any questions about any of the three bodies and what we do, we will stick around for a few minutes after the event. Um, please welcome to have a chat with us. Um, if you want to become a member, there are great subscription um, benefits. So uh, costs are relatively low, $35 for students, if there's any students in the room, or $172 for members. Uh, not only do you get discounted rates for events like this, you also get a subscription to the Energy News publication, um, and you get uh, opportunities to hear about events first. You can also look out for the mailing list on our website. Thanks very much to the fantastic team um, at the uh, Parliament, Parliament Hilton <laughs> uh, uh, who've hosted us here today. Um, and everyone, please have a safe journey home. Thank you. Thank you.